A lot of people, when they hear the word influence or persuasion, the image that comes to mind is of a smarmy car salesman kind of person that's absolutely repulsive to us on every single level. And the influence skills that I teach are influence skills that can help you get what you want and make a bigger mark in the world. And if you remember nothing else at all from today, that people are two or three times more likely to say yes when we ask them for help, when we make an in-person request than we think that they are, just ask and it rarely matters how. So the first key force of influence is called, I call it moments of truth. Procter & Gamble actually, our, the marketing department there coined this phrase. And this is just reminding you to keep in mind to ask at the best time that that person will be most receptive to say yes. So it could be they're most excited about you. It could be they just got a bunch of money. It could be this is the time when you're supposed to ask, like if it's an annual review, that's when you're supposed to ask for what's the next step in my job. But you can also think about moments of truth in more creative ways, like when will people be caring the most about the topic that you have um, to offer them or to ask them for. So this is an example of Procter & Gamble's laundry team in Beirut. This is like Tide. In Beirut, it's called Bonux. And they wanted to market this laundry detergent. And they were thinking about moments of truth because that's how they roll. They know how important it is. But they go, well, when are people going to be thinking about laundry detergent? When are they most likely to be interested in laundry detergent? Really, laundry detergent's not that interesting, so we don't think about it that often. So when do we think about laundry detergent? Probably when we're doing laundry, and kind of that's it. So are television ads going to be a good way to reach people when they're doing laundry? No. Radio ads? Not even. How do you reach people when they're doing laundry? Well, in Beirut, most people live in tall apartment buildings, and they have a washing machine, they don't have a dryer, and then they hang their laundry out to dry on the balcony. And what the brilliant marketing team realized was that they could reach people doing their laundry by putting ads <laughs> on the tops of buses. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is a moment of truth. Labeling. It's naming a behavior. And you can name a behavior that you want to encourage, or you can name a behavior that you want to discourage. So these researchers who were testing the power of labels, they were in cahoots at this elementary school with the principal and the custodian and the teachers. And in half of the classroom, all of those people said this to the kids. They said, you should be neat and tidy. And it serves as a reminder of something the kids know. And it doubles the amount of litter that gets thrown in the trash can instead of left in the classrooms. For the other half of the classroom, classrooms, they said to the kids, you are neat and tidy. And this is the label. This is, this is telling the kids how they are. And it's a positive label that gets them to step up and be closer to their best self. And in this case, they more than quintupled the amount of litter that the kids are throwing in the trash. So this is the power of a positive label to get someone to step into that better self that you see them as. You can also use a negative label. This is Durex Condom Company. <laughs> to all those who use our competitors' products. <laughs> Whether a label is negative or positive obviously depends on where you're coming from. Father, usually a positive label. Not always. <laughs>